Welcome to Heartwood Church Online. One song, one sermon, one Savior. This worship experience provides a taste of what in-person worship and formation is like at Heartwood Church. You can engage with us now by commenting on the video, filling out the online connection card at heartwood.church slash contact us, texting 651 321 3204, or giving through the Secure Tithely app or web link at hardwood.church slash give. There are various online meetings during the week you can be a part of. The ministry of Heartwood Church can be summarized in two words, life and strength. A life grows stronger when a person faithfully connects to Jesus, the source of life, and Heartwood Church helps people make and grow that connection in deep and practical ways. I hope you enjoy engaging online, and I invite you to come participate in person, engaging with God and the people behind this production. But until then, engage your spirit, your mind, and your body for worship. The Gospel reading for this morning is Matthew 16, 13 through 20. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But you, he asked them, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus responded, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I also, per, I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will have been loosed in heaven. Then he gave the disciples orders to tell no one that he was the Messiah. Let's pray. Lord, today, this morning, or whenever people are watching this video, we recognize who you are today. You are indeed the anointed one, the chosen one, the son of God. And yet we have a different command than you gave your disciples that day. We are not to keep silent about who you are, but tell. So today, we ask that in our worship, and even after we leave worship, we proclaim who you are. Let us proclaim who you are in song. Let us proclaim who you are with how we live our lives. And let us proclaim who you are to our friends, neighbors, and the world. So that other people may recognize who you are the Messiah, our Savior. And it's in your name we ask these things. Amen. Savior, I come, quiet my soul. Remember Flesh for my 
for this series is a woman celebrating the festival of holy to remind us that blessing doesn't always look like what we expect. I mentioned when we first began this series that holy is a festival celebrating the beginning of spring and the triumph of good over evil. It's a Hindu religious festival that is spread around the world and from what I've read Hindus don't have a problem with non-Hindus participating in holy. If you've ever seen or participated in a color run 5K, that may have been likely sprung from the organizing people knowing about the Festival of Holi. Again, from what I've read, Hindus don't have a problem with color run activities either, unless it's done for profit and or exclusionary. It's kind of like with Christians and Easter and Christmas. We generally think it's great that non-Christians celebrate those days. But we don't like it when it becomes about profit, materialism, Santa Claus, and the Easter Bunny instead of Jesus. I bring this up today because the blessing we are looking at is one of those things where if done correctly is a blessing to many people. But if acted on selfishly, it hurts many people. Today we're moving out of the Beatitudes in Matthew 5 to another passage where Jesus calls someone blessed. I think Jesus would still affirm in this passage that being blessed is living in the kingdom of heaven, having an assurance that God's with me and I'm with God. However, in Matthew 24, 45 through 51, Jesus tells a parable about what responsibility a person has to take to enter the kingdom of heaven. He says, Who then is a faithful and wise servant? whom his master has put in charge of his household to give them food at the proper time. Blessed is that servant whom the master finds doing his job when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But if that wicked servant says in his heart, my master is delayed and starts to beat his fellow servants and eats and drinks with drunkards, that servant's master will come on a day he does not expect him, and at an hour he does not know. He will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is unique compared to the Beatitudes because Jesus not only tells us what it takes and the rewards of being blessed, he also tells us about the person who is not blessed. Let's begin with the blessed servant. Jesus describes the servant uh, who will be blessed with three attributes, faithful, wise, and responsible. 
faithful, or its root word faith, can mean both being trustworthy and trusting another. For example, if I say my marriage is faithful, that can mean both that I love only my wife and I believe she loves only me. And we both act in accordance with that love. This servant being faithful means the master finds the servant trustworthy and that the servant trusts the master. Wise describes a person who is thinking ahead. Sometimes it's translated as shrewd or prudent. This servant knows that the actions they take today will have ramifications tomorrow or later. They may know this in part because they believe the master is faithful. So we have trustworthy, thinking ahead, and third, responsible. This servant has a specific responsibility. This servant is put over the whole household for the purpose of caring for the people of the household, quote, to give them food at their proper time. This person's responsibility is people. The servant may have rule over the money, the storehouse, the pantry, the building, but the purpose of having access to all those things is to make sure that the people of the household regularly and appropriately get fed. When the master returns, if the master finds the servant faithfully taking care of their responsibilities, then the servant is blessed. Now the servant enters into the kingdom, assured that he is with the master and the master is with him, because the servant is put in charge of all things. This is like Joseph in Potiphar's house. Joseph's story, this part of it, is in Genesis 39, 2-6, and 19-20, and 20, which says, the Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man, serving in the household of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made everything he did successful, Joseph found favor with his master and became his personal attendant. Potiphar also put him in charge of his household and placed all that he owned under his authority. From the time that he put him in charge of his household and all that he owned, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house because of Joseph. The Lord's blessing was on all that he owned in his house and in his fields. He left all that he owned under Joseph's authority. He did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. Now Joseph was well built and handsome. In verse 19, when his master heard the story, his wife told him, these are the things that your slave did to me. He was furious and had him thrown into prison where the king's prisoners were confined. So Joseph was there in prison. So Joseph is a faithful servant, and Potiphar puts him in charge of everything. Now I said, blessed is knowing that you're with the master and the master is with you. And Joseph has this, not just before he's accused, but even after. When Potiphar's wife accuses Joseph of rape, Potiphar is angry, but it doesn't say that he's angry with Joseph. Potiphar is still on Joseph's side because Joseph was faithful, wise, and responsible. Joseph took care of people in the household. He didn't abuse or rape them. Joseph being put in jail is Potiphar protecting Joseph because the actual punishment for rape should have been death. This is another case where a blessing doesn't always look like a blessing at first. When we read and study parables like this, the natural application is to think this. How responsible am I with the things God has entrusted to me? But that's an incorrect question because this is not the parable of the talents. Instead, I have to ask myself, am I faithful with the people God has entrusted to me? This application is both for me as an individual and for a whole church. God has entrusted me with children. For some of you, God may have also entrusted you with grandchildren or great-grandchildren, or maybe even help out like with your neighbor's kids. Some of the application is different for a grandparent than a parent, but you know where you are in life. You know, do I make sure their physical needs are met? Do I make sure my children's emotional needs are met? Do I regularly pray for my children? Do I regularly spend time with my children? 
Do I make sure my children are properly educated? Do I teach my children and am I a model about a relationship with Jesus? In all these things, is what I'm doing appropriate to the age and maturity of my children? You know, all these things are like giving them food at the proper time. Some of us may also have spouses, siblings, adult children that God may have given us some responsibility for. And God also entrusts me with people beyond my blood family. The servant in Jesus' parable couldn't possibly be related to everyone in the household. I have a responsibility to other in the household of faith, Galatians 6.10. I have a responsibility to those in the household of my friendship circles, Matthew 12, 31. I have a responsibility to those in my community and to those in my world, Matthew 28, 19, and 20. This has been super difficult during COVID-19, and it's a lot harder you know, to just go meet someone or a group of people for coffee and build into their lives. It's hard for me to get a babysitter so I can be free. Some people don't want to leave their houses. I heard a story from someone, not a member of our church, that said their spouse has only left the house five times in the last six months. And this was not an elderly person in a high-risk category. Also, not everyone has the same degree of comfort with technology. And those of us who enjoy technology are getting tired of it. This is not new technology, but personally, I don't enjoy talking on the phone. I will gladly send someone a letter, a note, a text, email, Facebook message. I will drive across town or even out of town in order to talk to someone in person. But I'm just not a big telephone talker. But sometimes the telephone is the best way to meet a need or find out about a need. I'm thankful that many of you at Hartwood Church are good at this way of taking care of people where I'm not as good. Regardless of the medium used, it takes intentional communication to care for people. I'm starting to learn from and recommend a YouTube channel called Contagious Disciple Making. This site contains very practical lessons on things like how to talk with friends who don't know Jesus, how to pray for our community, how to make disciples while social distancing, um, disciple making habits, and helping others discover God. As a church, we should try to meet the physical needs of our community. We do what we can at our current size, and we have a lot of community partners that we trust to do the things that we cannot. But our first responsibility is to the spiritual needs of those God has put in our community household. Think about this. Jesus fed 5,000 people after he spent the whole day teaching them about God. Jesus forgave a man's sins, healed that man's legs, and later died on the cross to pay for those sins he forgave. After his resurrection, Jesus promised his disciples the Holy Spirit and fed his disciples breakfast on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. Blessed is the person who is faithful in their God-given responsibility of people. Next, let's look at the person who's not blessed. Back to verses 48 through 51. Jesus says, But if that wicked servant says in his heart, My master is delayed, and starts to beat his fellow servants, and eats and drinks with drunkards, that servant's master will come on a day he does not expect him, and at an hour he does not know. He will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now Jesus tells us about the cursed servant. Jesus also has several descriptions for this other servant. The first attribute Jesus uses is wicked. As with many Greek words, there are a few ways of translating this word, but I think because Jesus is contrasting the two servants, a good definition would be worthless. Jesus could be describing evil in the servant's heart, but I don't think that's necessary. This person may not be just like internally evil. The first servant was very useful and valuable to the master, 
And the second one is the opposite, useless and worthless. The second servant shows their worthlessness by not being faithful. The servant says to himself, my master is delayed. There's not only no concern for the master, but also an assumption that the master may never come back. Even if the master does come back, I'll have plenty of time to clean up my mess well before then. Also, this servant has the same responsibilities and resources as the first, but the second servant beats the people of the household instead of feeding them. The servant uses all the resources for himself and does so in a wasteful manner. He doesn't just drink, he drinks until he's drunk. He doesn't just get drunk alone, he invites other drunkards to come drink to excess with him. Jesus is describing someone who is uncaring about themselves, about others, or the future. He's describing a person who is self-indulgent. We need to remember something. Just because people may be unfaithful, the master is always faithful. 2 Timothy 2.13 says, If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny who he is. The master will always come back. The master will always give the appropriate reward or punishment. I would much prefer to preach a sermon that has the phrase, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life, as Bill Bright wrote as the first of the four spiritual laws. But we also shouldn't shrink away from the truth that there are people who reject God's wonderful plan and choose to make their own plan. God still has a plan for those people as well, and unfortunately, it's not so wonderful. Whereas the faithful servant was given everything, the unfaithful servant is destroyed. Jesus describes two different punishments, neither of which would be typical for a servant or slave in Jesus' time. The first is being cut into pieces. This was not a Jewish form of execution, but would have been known to happen among the people they lived with and around. The usual method was to execute someone first and then dismember the corpse. But the Romans were also known to kill someone by tearing them apart. It's, a brutal, it's brutal either way, and there's no chance of survival. By comparison, the second punishment actually doesn't sound so bad. Assigned a place with the hypocrites where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That also sounds odd to us because why would you assign, assign someone to a place with the hypocrites after the person is already dead? Um, I don't think Jesus is talking about where the person is going to be buried. It seems that Jesus is describing uh, physical, temporal punishment that happens in the servant's lifetime, that life being cut short, and also a spiritual punishment after death. The person who doesn't serve the master as they should will certainly die, and will also go to a place of judgment and sorrow instead of reward after they die. The journalist Clark Beach said this on September 6, 1941. A Japanese attack on Hawaii is regarded as the most unlikely thing in the world, with one chance in a million of being successful. Besides saving more powerful defenses than any other post under the American flag, it's protected by distance. And of course, three months later, Hawaii was successfully attacked by the Japanese because we weren't ready. Jesus' purpose in this parable is not the threat of punishment nor the promise of reward. The purpose is the certainty of Jesus' return. There is personal and church application in the cursed servant's uh, story as well. If I don't fulfill my responsibility for my children, I could lose my children, either to child welfare office or when they get older, they may want to have nothing to do with me. I could be left as an old man alone where I'm you know, left weeping and gnashing of teeth, so to speak. Or they may choose not to follow Jesus and I lose them for eternity. For the church, I think this parable is especially urgent. In Revelation chapter 1, Jesus is seen 
walking among lampstands, and those lampstands represent churches in different cities. Then in Revelation chapter 2, in the letter to Ephesus, Jesus is again said to be walking among the lampstands, and he gives the church in Ephesus a warning. Revelation 2, 5 says, Remember then how far you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. Otherwise, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. We can't know for certain what the first works this church had been doing were, but we do know what the first works are that Jesus gave all of his followers to do after his resurrection. Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. A church that is not making disciples may find itself like the unfaithful servant, dead physically, that is closed, and removed spiritually. The punishment of the unfaithful servant was the separation of his body. And the church in 1 Corinthians 12 is also called a body. The separation of this body is not the future I see for Heartwood Church. I see us being a catalyst for lighting more lampstands. COVID-19 will not and cannot make us close, but not making disciples can. Not being faithfully responsible for people can close a church. While this parable ends with a warning, I don't want to end on a negative tone. Let's remember the blessing. Blessed is that servant whom the master finds doing his job when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. When Jesus sees his followers faithfully, faithfully doing what we're supposed to be doing, both now and when he returns, the blessing is literally everything. I believe in our lifetimes, the meaning of this parable uh, of the talents and the parable of the servants is, is the same. When we are faithful with the amount of responsibility God has given us, God will then give us more. Church growth strategy isn't about programming or buildings. It's about faithfully making disciples. How many disciples? One. I'll be faithful with one. You be faithful with one. Secondly, this relates to the many promises of blessing that we saw in the Beatitudes. Those who are faithful get to live in and rule in the kingdom of heaven. For me, I had to learn how to be responsible with a goldfish before I could be truly responsible with a dog or a cat or a family. I think God wants us to learn to be faithfully responsible with a few people so that we will be able one day to be responsible for all of creation. There are several ways to measure the health of a church congregation. And in the past, it's largely been measured by a few numbers. Numbers of bodies in the seats on Sunday morning, numbers of confessions of faith, baptism, and the budget. More recently, we, that's our church, our district, our denomination, and even the church worldwide is looking at the impact we are having on individual lives and communities as measures of health. Some of the examples are, how many people have I had in my home this past month? What's the number of specific people being prayed for, both inside and outside of the church? What's the number of people engaged in daily spiritual formation? What's the number of hours people spend in direct ministry to community needs? What's the number of people reporting personal debt retirement? What's the number of community organizations that use the church facilities? Um, another one, what's the amount of space on the church's website dedicated to community events and engagement? So those are different measurements. I'm not for ditching all the traditional numbers. Even the church of, in Acts counted the number of people who believed and were baptized. And they also kept lists of the number of widows they fed. You know, two of our partners, Tubman and First Care Pregnancy Centers, they have great community out 
impact. But people generally don't come to faith there or get baptized there and get discipled there. We've also got to, we have to pay our utility bill. So we can't just ditch all the numbers. But this is really to me about seeing how intentional I am and we are about focusing on people. I try to spend some time each week doing some work around the facility. This week, I replaced one of our exit signs, I replaced our HVAC filter, and I did some yard work. But not because the facility is the priority, but because I'm responsible for the people who use this facility. I want them to have clean air to breathe. And I want to be up to date on the fire code for their safety. I like having a facility to meet in. I think a building can be a valuable tool and asset. At various churches I was in while growing up and living in California, we often didn't have a building, and that had its own difficulties. But not having a building allowed us and forced us to spend most of our time ministering to people. So let's not be distracted by facility issues, by COVID-19 restrictions, by our country's politics, or by our own desire for comfort and safety. But instead, let's faithfully take responsibility for people. Jesus asks in Luke 18.8, When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Let us be found faithful. Today, as we remember our responsibility to the Great Commission, let's not forget Jesus' final words in that command. I am with you always, even until the end of the age. And we're going to remember his faithfulness as Israel did in Psalm 124 as we pray. If the Lord had not been on our side when people attacked us, then they would have swallowed us alive. The water would have drowned us. But the Lord has not let us be ripped apart. Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Faithful God today We repent of any unfaithfulness in our responsibility of people, and we ask you to help us care as you care, serve as you serve, and be faithful as you are faithful as we seek to increase those who call upon your name and worship and serve you in spirit and in truth, so that the blessing may spread to many. Amen. As you reflect on this message, think of one thing that resonated with you, one thing that challenged you, one thing you want to learn more about, and one thing you will do based on what you've heard. Today, I challenge and urge you to faithfully go and make disciples. Mm